Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series, Reflections in Time, was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgie more than 15 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. This is how Paul began many of the 73 interviews that he recorded. It's often exciting to look at the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop stop and take a look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that helped make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960 and I served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgie in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. It's a beautiful day and the end of, the, uh, end of uh, September in year 2000. We're here in the studios of KYNE. And I have as my guest today, uh, Professor Charles Gildersleeve. Uh, the, he's a, uh, Chuck is a professor in uh, the Department of Geography, professor of geography. And he's served in all faculty ranks from instructor to professor. Mm -hmm. When did you start, Chuck? Was it in the 60s, wasn't it? Yes, uh, I came here in the fall of 64. It's 1964, Jack. Gee, that's uh, only four years less than I've been. I know, yeah. I know. And you uh, served as department chairman for a while? Yeah, about eight years, that, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. I was dean when you were department That's right. chairman. We worked together quite closely. That's right. Um, one thing I don't think I've ever talked to you a, a great deal about, though, is uh, your background, your roots. Uh, I know you come from Iowa. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us something about it, would you please? Well, my, my parents come from Wayne County, Nebraska. Uh -huh. And uh, my dad taught at Why Not for a while. And he got this job at uh, in the center of Iowa, a little town called Zeering, and he went back and married my mother and, and uh, uh, moved on to Traer, Iowa, just south of Waterloo, where I was born in 1940. And from there, we moved to Osage, Iowa, for a teaching job, and from there to Bowling Green, Ohio, where Dad was working on his uh, master's in, um, in, in mathematics mm -hmm. uh, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, he'd commute and so things like that. And then the war came. And he was going to be drafted, and he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, and went to his officer training school at Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, we just bounced all over the country, from La Junta, Colorado, to Long Beach, California, to uh, Gilbert, Arizona, to Tinker, Oklahoma City, and then finally taking a train. Now, how old were you when all this was happening? Oh, golly, age two. Well, I was born. I was nothing in prayer. <laughs> but you're talking about the movement. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I, I knew you meant that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was between the ages of three and about six, mm -hmm. right? And then we, after the war, uh, we ended up in um, in uh, Washington D.C. for a year where I lived, and uh, in a situation where the schools were separated, right? They were segregated, mm -hmm. black schools mm -hmm. and white schools. And then we moved to uh, Al Qaeda and then on to Zeering, Iowa, where I really grew up from age seven through 19 when I left okay. at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, for your higher education, you went on to the University of Arizona. Yes. I how, how come you, you chose well, Arizona? I, I took one of these aptitude tests, that, because I didn't know what I was going mm -hmm. to do, because a, a small high school in Zeering, I call it Cupcake Corners, it's just five mm -hmm. teachers, and you had to take everything they offered. It is on the map. Uh, it's, but yeah, it's in the crack of the road, <laughs> Atlas, though, and you sometimes can't find it. That's the old joke I tell, but uh, uh, I went to Northern Iowa, Iowa State Teachers College at the time, and uh, didn't really want to be involved in 
teacher education like my father was and so started looking at some of the things and I, and I learned about urban planning at the University of Arizona at the time offered an undergraduate degree in it along with Tennessee there were only two schools at mm -hmm. the time that specialized in it and was in the geography department so off I went great yeah. mm -hmm. and then you um, went to graduate school there. right I right. got your master's degree. That's right. Vietnam was starting. I was 1A in the draft, even though <laughs> I was married and had a child and couldn't get a job because people say, well, we'd like to have you, but you haven't had your military mm -hmm. service. And so uh, I got a call from the chairman of the department. Would you like a teaching assistantship and work on a master's in geography? And I said, yeah, I could at least wait that out, yeah. you know, and, and it just kept going and going. And I ended up here then after that. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you end up in Omaha? That's a, I mean, you're down in Arizona yeah. now. Uh, how, how, how did you get to well, Omaha? I taught for two years at the University of Arizona. And in speaking with my wife, I decided, you know, I kind of like this teaching, college teaching and research business. Why don't I continue with it? Most of the doctorate programs in geography that were easy to get to were in the Middle West at the time, Jack. So mm -hmm. I applied for positions. And uh, I had final interviews with uh, Central Missouri State at Warrensburg and then here and I took this job because I didn't know whether I wanted to go to Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa or Minnesota for my mm -hmm. program and, and then I came here mainly to get a job so I could go on for the PhD somewhere mm -hmm. and I obviously selected the University of Nebraska where so mm -hmm. you were interested in a college teaching career early yes. on you were probably a, a teaching assistant or an instructor I was a teaching Arizona. assistant for one year and an instructor of geography for two years before I mm -hmm. moved on here you could only teach for two years mm -hmm. at the University of Arizona without you know the sure. terminal degree at the time so and then you did some research down there too yes I did it? I mean other than your dissertation obviously I mean, yeah, you did work for a research bureau right. uh, my master's thesis was on comparisons of land use against the models statistically mm -hmm. and otherwise and uh, I, I got pretty good at land use mapping, and I walked into this agency because I needed a summer job. We had a little child. Mm -hmm. you know, I needed a summer job. We didn't teach summers. And I uh, said, oh, we just need somebody like that. And I worked uh, with the Bureau of Business and Economic Research for two years doing field mapping. And that's where I got into the study of some of the border cities because that was one of their projects. And as you know, that continued yeah. on. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. but we'll, we'll get to that sure. in, a, okay. in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, so you um, you ended up though in Omaha. Yes. Um, and uh, you remember what that was like? Did yeah. you come here for an interview with uh, I guess 1964? That would have been Dr. Bale, wouldn't it? You bet. It was an eight-hour flight from Tucson via Frontier Airlines, landing six or eight times up and down, up and down. <laughs> Getting here in February it was 11 degrees above zero, and of course I had no coat because I'd been in Tucson for five years, and I borrowed one from somebody, a graduate student in sociology, and uh, they put me up in the old Fontenelle Hotel. Wow. Cab picked me up, took me out to A little campus. bit of history, right? Yeah, there. yeah. Yeah, I thought that was pretty nice, and uh, I interviewed with everybody, but I think the most awesome thing when you mentioned Bale was that I even had an interview with the president. Oh, he interviewed every. I know. I didn't know that. And you interviewed, I'll bet, every single dean. Yes, every single dean. That happened to me too. Oh, I see. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was, was interesting. rather different. Yeah, it you was know, very different. Because University of Arizona was a bigger school, and you were sort of, you know, mm -hmm. autonomous college by college. <laughs> when did you start uh, your graduate work on your doctoral degree? I started commuting to Lincoln in 1966. Okay, so that was shortly after you... Very came. shortly after. I talked to Leslie Hughes down there, who just passed away a year ago, and uh, thought that I ought to come to Nebraska. And my chairman at uh, Arizona thought I ought to study under Leslie Hughes. I never knew why, and now I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how it all got started. Yeah. So, um, I take it you had a very good experience? There? Yeah, I commuted sometimes two days a week, sometimes three days a week to Lincoln. Plus, of course, teaching the 12 to 15 hour load yeah. that we had at the time, teaching load. Uh -huh. That's not an easy thing to do. Nope. I mean, with all of the classes you were teaching That's here right. and then to be a, essentially had two full-time jobs. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Plus, at the time, I was not only the advisor to the geography honorary, but also advisor to the Pen and Sword Society, Jack, that had 800 members at that time. And I was their, their advisor, I think, for five or six years. Tell us about Pen and Sword. Yeah, Pen and Sword was an organization of the military bootstrappers group. Oh, and bootstrappers? Bootstrappers were assigned here for at least six months, 
they had to get their last 24 credits mm -hmm. here, and we signed a kind of a contract with the you know, with the with the armed forces that people could come here if they give them a TDY or sign them here, and we could guarantee them a degree if they satisfactorily pass 24 hours. That was an agreement that was worked out, I think, between Dr. Bale and right. General LeMay at one point. LeMay and Bale, mm -hmm. right? And by the way, LeMay was my dad's. Oh really? Officer yeah. during the, yeah, commanding officer during the uh, World War II. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. But that, and yeah, and and of course, what we had to do then was teach our normal 12 or, or 15 hour load. Plus, many of us taught in this little five week sessions, mm -hmm. because the semester was 18 weeks long then, Jack, not 15 weeks. Right. And so they had to finish in a shorter time, six months. And so we'd go through the semester, and then they'd have a five week session. And we get five hundred dollars a course, or six hundred dollars a course, if you're an assistant professor, and so on. Well, it must have been uh, kind of interesting. With the these bootstrappers were military people yes. who'd been all around the world, and you're teaching them geography. Uh, right. They've probably seen places that you probably oh. haven't seen to this day. Oh, without question, and that's one thing I think that drew them to geography. They yeah. felt that they had a background in it, and the military mm -hmm. Did they? had a lot of training. Oh, oh, yeah, and, they, and they studied they very good? hard. They were very good students, very focused. Everybody, uh, well, I right. remember from personal experience, right. but everybody tells me that too, that those right. were the best students they and, ever And had. also very fussy, you know, because their time was so sure. constricted. They had so many hours to take and uh, uh, a marvelous group of people. And we got a lot of good students uh, out of that group. Yeah. Right. And, uh, well, what was the... Uh, Remember when you first came here back in '64? What was the curriculum and geography like? Okay. Well, let me ask first. What was the faculty like? How many people were? We on? had four. Four geographers. Yeah. Uh, uh, was uh, the year I came, the year before I came, I interviewed with Gordon Shills, Nicholas Barris, Al Larson, and Charles Webb. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know at the time that Larson and Webb were leaving. And so I was a replacement for one of them, and then Phil Vogel ended up being the replacement sure. for the other. And so there were four of us. Now, what's interesting is that my contract stated that half of my load each semester were, was to be taught at Offutt Air Force Base in their educational program. That's how Gordon justified that mm -hmm. position. And that was the Charles Webb position. And it got so that the enrollment got so large, Jack, that I requested that you take a look at I asked Gordon to take a look at keeping me on campus a little bit longer, yeah. more. I didn't mind going out there for a course or, or two, because that was part of my contract. But we needed people here, and we just didn't have the money to hire them. And so I only taught one course a semester after that first year right. out there, rather than two courses a semester out there. So it was an interesting thing. It all started with Dick Thoman in 58, and then Gordon in 1960, and evolving a program after he'd returned from Ethiopia. I suppose you remember sure. he was in Ethiopia for years. Yes, Gordon yeah. um, right. traveled a good bit. Oh, yes. He was in Afghanistan for a while. Right, too. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, uh, let's go back to the curriculum. What okay. was the curriculum like? Was it a whole lot different than today, or must have been more restricted? You had fewer faculty members. It was more. It was restricted. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more traditional in a small university. We did not have computer geography, remote sensing. We didn't have room for quantitative analysis in geography, which I wanted to teach, which I mm -hmm. taught later. Uh, by 1970, I was able to do that. But yeah, but uh, it was pretty darn good with regional courses and the major systematic courses from human geography, physical geography, and Africa and Latin America. <laughs> Uh, Europe, Asia, uh, physical geography. Uh, we were able to finally, three years after I came, start a cartography course. Mm -hmm. That would put our students in line for going on to graduate school somewhere. Yeah. But we also started our own graduate program in 1965. Okay, and so that really gave a lot of impetus to the faculty to make it really exciting. And and I think with the graduate program. We didn't have the turnover at the university we did in the middle 60s. Like a third of the faculty mm -hmm. would turn over when I first came, my first couple, three years. But as the graduate programs grew, more and more faculty, I think, stayed put and didn't leave the university. Of course, then there was the merger, which sure. you're going to talk about probably. Now, we'll certainly yeah. get to mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. you, uh, you got your Ph.D. at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Yes. And, uh, and in geography. In obviously. geography. Uh, what was the emphasis in there? I remember earlier you'd be been looking at uh, the 
uh, U.S.-Mexico right. border. Uh, right. What was your interest well, in your doctoral work? It all goes back to the undergraduate, Jack, where I was involved with my first degree was in regional and city planning. Right, right. My master's was in, in geography, but with a focus on urban and economic mm -hmm. geography. My, my, and my Ph.D. continued into that area. And uh, because I had passed the proficiency exam in Spanish, they dredged up an old rule that I didn't know about at Lincoln in the department and enforced it that anybody who has Spanish proficiency must do a Latin American thesis. Well, I'd spent some time writing articles and reading papers on some border city case studies, mm -hmm. and I proposed the U.S.-Mexico border uh, studies one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was really better for me. Except for five years in the field and writing got a little bit long, yeah, but yeah. yeah. It must yeah. have been interesting. I mean, oh, I kind of so. fun. Oh, it really was. Did really you was. get to travel down there and yeah. along the border yeah. and talk to people and look oh, at the land and sure. all that kind oh, yeah. of stuff? Yeah, we did urban studies and urban yeah. structural studies and trade area studies and showing the differences and similarities in this cross-cultural hybrid city. Yeah. But don't get me on this. We don't have time to go through the... Well, I know I'm going to continue okay. uh, because I remember one of your other interests is in... Uh, uh, country western music. Oh, you do. And, huh? uh, some of that uh, <laughs> doesn't. Some of that uh, tie in yep. with this uh, yeah. cross-border interest, weren't you? Some uh, Latin music too. That, that's true. That's true. Uh, the western part of country western music, from the Hispanic and from some of the early Texas cowboy roots, mm. from Texas through Arizona, uh, had a great deal to do with the development of the western side of country music, so to speak. And uh, I've written several articles for. Uh, country western magazines on the origin and spread of country and western mm -hmm. music and the geography found in the lyrics of country and western music and he even wrote an urban geography on uh, it was called why branson mm -hmm. how did it come about from the old baseball camp and fishing center to one that's a lot of yeehaw music and handy williams and a uh, japanese violinist and all sorts of people that's, uh, that's really you know kind of interesting mm -hmm. that you it is. that your um, uh, interest can 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 be so broad mm -hmm. and can spread out from geography to all of these other areas right. that, that have a very logical relationship. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Yeah, they do because uh, geography is one that kind of integrates subjects in a place. Yeah, to me, that's always been one of the joys of being a university professor. Yes. that you get uh, not only an opportunity to delve in a number of things, but also right. to meet other people that right. have. And, uh, right. And, and you know, Jack, the students, too. The students give me a lot of ideas for research and writing, mm -hmm. e even undergraduate ones in freshman classes, because I'll ask a question, and, and that, that's, it, that's the joy of this business. I mean, you know about that, of course. Yeah, right. Well, you had, um, you had a number of years as chairman of the geography mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. uh, when you became chair, uh, did that, um, was the department much different than when you first yeah. arrived? Yeah. Uh, Obviously, it had a different name. It was the uh, University of Nebraska at Ole Miss, right. uh, not the. Right. Uh, and you referred to that a moment ago when right. we talked about the merger, yeah. and uh, we used that term on campus. Those of us who That's were right. around at the time used that term to uh, refer to the merging of the u municipal university right. of Omaha with the Nebraska state right. uh, higher education right. system, University of Nebraska. Um, but uh, I imagine some of those changes uh, that we're going to talk about now um, came from that. Yes. Um, Gordon Shills had one geology course and hired an nor inner north at the time, northern natural gas guy, mm -hmm. who was very, very good to teach a Saturday geology survey. In 1969, when I was doing residency for the Ph.D., the department expanded greatly because of the huge blossom of enrollment here. You know, getting Jack Schroeder as a geologist, Phil Vogel came back from Oregon, Chris Jung was hired, started the Afghan Studies mm -hmm. Program and the International Studies and, and, and things of that nature, among other faculty who came in. And uh, Lee Bush and, and Dan Ehrlich and it just goes, John Zippe, Lee Slarp, mm -hmm. all these people were coming in because of the expansion of the school. When I became chair, we thought it would be good to expand the department so it's geography and geology. We felt there was a real interest among the student body and graduate education for some of our physical geographers to have a good solid geograph geology component. So my first year as chair, that was my first year as chair, 
ended up at the Board of Regents, you were there too, I think, defending it. And they passed, and uh, we've added uh, four geologists. And so now we have seven geographers, full-time, one temporary full-time, if you understand mm -hmm. that, and, and, and then, of course, four geologists. That's pretty darn good out of the department that, you know, started with just four, yeah, people, four yeah. people. Started really in 1958 with old Richard Thoman, a very important econo economic geographer who went to Canada from here. Mm -hmm. But Gordon Schills was the one that really got it rolling, and he, and, he, and he did the right paperwork. And all I did was pick that up with the help of Jack Schroeder and some of our physical geographers, went and proposed a geology program. And it worked out nicely. So we're a married department now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were. Um what were some of the challenges of uh, being a department chair back in 1981? Well, as a young chair, was really working hard to get that, uh, with, with my faculty, to get the uh, geology program approved. That was another thing. There were other changes occurring, and you're well aware of them because you had to send them to us, and we had to report all the time that uh, the regents continued to want to have more information on departments with more annual reviews and five-year reviews and three-year interim reviews and all sorts of things, okay? In the meantime, uh, there's a difficulty of a new group being formed. We didn't know what to do with the Nebraska State Coordinating Commission for Post-Secondary Education. That was to oversee everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, what does this mean? And so uh, the challenges were getting reports to you on time and getting the data keeping the faculty happy so they were teaching and writing and doing the service they were supposed to be doing rather than writing all of these reports and that the, the challenge was is to have them write parts of it and have me put it together so they would so they could go about teaching their their courses in writing you now by this time as you've mentioned you had not only um, geographers in the department but geologists yes. as well mm -hmm. so it um, while there are obviously there are obvious relationships between mm -hmm. those two disciplines. Right. They are separate disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, any challenges related to that? Yeah. Um, geology being a systematic field and geography being a holistic field, mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult for some folks to understand other folks in the department about their research and writing. Okay. And that uh, sometimes one of the disciplines like geology would look upon itself until they got to know what we did as not a science. Mm -hmm. And the geographers would sometimes object to that and think geology is pretty limited and short sighted. So there were some internal problems, you know, that could have been serious, but uh, most of the time uh, it was okay. Uh, the standard family problems. And the challenge was is get everybody to get along and be collegial. Mm. And that is difficult, especially for some people, to be blunt, who don't understand what the word means. Okay? What the word collegial means. Right. What does it mean? Well, I'm not sure, Jack. <laughs> but with what I mean, checking what I mean is that people get together, set aside their petty differences, and work for the greater good of the whole in an understanding way. Yes. And you were, if I remember correctly, it's only a few years now. Well, yeah. More than, I, well. But uh, if I remember, you were very, very effective in achieving uh, that. There were times when it was difficult. Yeah. But that happens to every chair. I mean, I know departments of geography. I know departments of English and geology yes. that are just separate. They aren't married. They have more problems than we had. And that's one thing that I try to point out. And, uh, well, if there was ever any question about geography being a science, I would suspect that it would be settled when you uh, moved into a building that's named the Science <laughs> Building, because how could you uh, not be a science? Is a rose by any other name building? is still a rose? Uh, yeah. I remember uh, when that building was constructed, and you were, yeah. um, you were right there oh on the boy, scene. Oh, boy, well, you remember that. Er this is, we're talking about weeks, the, yeah. what's now called the Durham Science Center. Right, Durham right. Science Center. Uh, I was going to say, it was back in... Spring of 69, mm -hmm. again, 1969, Jack, we're old. Um, Elder Talek and I were asked to sit down and do diagrams of a new building. Oh, boy, one year since the merger, and we're talking about geography going into a new building. We know that we can expand geography, maybe add geology. We laid the plans down, and the priority was number one, and then went to number 10, number 11. The Devaney Center came in. Lots of buildings were messing around all over the place, and the regions were adjusting to an expanded Mm -hmm. multi-campus organization. It was 19 years from the time Harold Rotalik and I first drew those plans 
the time we walked into the building in July. Uh, I remember sitting down with the architect, well, it wasn't the architectural yeah. firm that uh, designed the right. building, but it was the planning firm. Right. And they um, took us out in the country someplace mm -hmm. to a retreat they had. That's right. And all of the department chairmen from the different departments right. concerned sat down. I, as dean, sat down with That's you right. and uh, we ironed things out about what this building should have That's in right. it. That's right. That was a marvelous experience. In fact, I'm pretty proud of that whole process now because in all my years here it was one of the few buildings where the faculty and the academic dean had a direct role in planning the space and justifying the space before all right you guys build a box with the space you want we'll try to fit it in and design the building you know mm -hmm. we actually had a role we fought for certain space we gave up space we got space and it was wonderful and so it's a very, very nice and functional building with student space. It is. It's a That's superb right. building, oh. and uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude to the Durhams for oh. uh, uh, making it possible. Without question. Which, uh, a number of other people, some, too, well, donated to the, labs. To the citizens of the state of Nebraska, yeah. too. I guess we can't yeah. forget the uh, yeah. tax dollars. Well, sure, the Durhams are the biggest, and, and they should be given all the credit in the world. But there's also, the, you know, the, 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 the saps and, 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 the, and, and the people that donated the, uh, I mean, had a microscope lab, the people at remote sensing lab, the uh, planetarium. Yes. yes. Which has All turned out to be oh. a wonderful yeah. facility. And it's a nice building. And, and the only problem I had with that, Jack, was that it was very difficult for me to envision <laughs> having a planetarium in the middle of a building when the gall darn things are usually on the end. You know, that someplace. was, that was yeah. built at the instigation of the physics department yes. because they had astronomy courses. But I should think that would be interesting to a geographer, too. Oh, without question. Do you oh, ever yeah. use the planetarium yes. in any of your yeah. classes? Yeah, yeah. Some of the physical geographers do. Oh. We go to the programs and we run through, and and uh, they have some really good instructional ones that we, that mm -hmm. we can use. Right. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. turned out to be a wonderful recreational right. facility right. as well with the music programs right. they do there. Oh, it's and, wonderful. Uh, and just and the science shows for kids right. and uh, all. This and we have plenty of, plenty of big spaces for uh, bringing guest lecturers to give public mm -hmm. lectures in, in in the big lecture halls and. Uh, uh, even after, what, 13 years now, Jank, uh, it's still a very nice building, very nice building. Speaking of uh, kids, I just mentioned them a moment ago. Uh, uh, one of your activities has been with, uh, 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 with the schools in the mm -hmm. Geography B. Could you tell mm -hmm. us something about that? How did you get involved in it to well, begin with, and what's it like? What does it do? <laughs> Twelve years ago, it be 13 years mm -hmm. come August, or come April, National Geographic Society had done a, a survey, a Gallup survey, by the way. You know, Gallup is coming in here. Yes. And it ascertained uh, that our generation, Jack, did better on geography and international kinds of things than the generation of the 18 to 24 year old. Well, this is unheard of because we've been out of school for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, of course, we're in, in this business, we know a little bit more, but the average citizen did better. And that was the only country in the world where that happened. Plus, we scored, those kids scored second to the last, only to one of the less developed countries. So National Geographic says, it's our job, we're going to do something. We're going to start a National Geography Bee, which is now the National Geographic Bee. They changed their name a little bit, it's still a Geography Bee. And um, you have about uh, from 350 to 600 schools who participate. These school winners take a national exam. And then that's where I come in, the top 100 of mm -hmm. those kids and scoring that exam get to come to Omaha here, you know, although I don't advertise the school because it's an all-state thing and that, you know, advertises itself. And the winner of this gets to go back to Washington and compete for a $25,000 college scholarship. This has been going on for 12 years. And we had one kid come in third, a kid out of Orchard, Nebraska. Oh. Got a $10,000 scholarship. So that, that was exciting. So I've been doing that for 12 years. Now, exactly what is your role in that? I am the state coordinator. Uh -huh approved by National Geographic to do that and I had to go around getting your approval and I think somebody else in the back, uh, Otto Bauer was mm -hmm. academic dean of ac or vice chancellor of academic affairs mm -hmm. at the time and uh, to do this and uh, yeah it involves most of our department many many students and it's just a fun time for one day in April 
And so that reflects yeah. both your interest in the discipline of geography oh, yeah. and in the teaching process, yes. because that's right. uh, that's what it's all about. Of course, about. my research in recent years has, and my grant writing has gone towards the pedagogical. Yes, yes. Because somebody had to do it, I felt. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you've done a good bit in summer workshops and that sort of thing. Summer too. workshops, two or three of them every year, uh, grants that... Uh, and those summer workshops are for whom? Teachers. High school? K-12 teachers. Okay. K-12 teachers. Right. Some of them are institutes where we train teachers to teach other teachers. Mm -hmm. Some of them are informational ones where they can go into the classroom, such as the geography of the frontier. How does geography fit into history? Okay. Uh, the last one we had was with uh, NASA geographers who work for Hernandez Engineering, a contract group, who train the astronauts and what the devil they're looking at when they're flying around. Well, not flying, they're orbiting. Yes. That's the proper term, orbiting. And they're supposed to take pictures. And these engineers and PhDs and scientists know less about the Earth, okay, than a lot of my college freshmen do. And so they got to train these people what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And so we worked that out with them to do a workshop called Learning Geography from Space. And, and the teachers would get 75 photos taken by the astronauts, slides mm -hmm. and photos, and lesson plans with each one of them. So that, uh, because part of geography is earth science, physical geography. Yes. And so these teachers are learning to integrate. And I'm going to write another grant to the Eisenhower Foundation to hopefully hold another one, but this time in Kearney. Well, we've had many of them. We've had computer workshops that are virtual intelligence workshops to train teachers to study Native Americans and teach their kids to study Native American geography in Nebraska through the computer and through the web, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the grants have been from, since I took over, I've been in this 11 or 12 years, I've, I've been the chief coordinator of it for six. Uh, my grants have totaled about $100,000 a year. Obviously, yeah. teaching is, has been a, an abiding interest yeah. with you. Uh, yeah. you're, too honest, too modest, I'm sure, to mention it yourself, but uh, I remember seeing your picture on a wall here with a group of others. With the number under it? With, it says, no, no. With the number 1976. No, 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 oh, yeah, okay, number, yes. okay, not a number. When okay. you won the uh, Great Teacher Award <laughs> yeah, here. Mm, it's that being, was really uh, nice. One of the best of the best. April the 1976, I think. Mm -hmm. April 25th. I'll and not forget. only that, it's not just at UNO locally, but. Uh, you won the National Distinguished Teaching Award in 1989 from the National Council for Geographic That's right. Education. That's right. That's, That's a, a, a very nice, prestigious must award. Must be very nice to get that oh, yeah, kind of recognition yeah. from pe you know your peers, people that you respect. Re and and that, that's a. All of these are very selective processes. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember the Great Teacher Award, there was only one given. That's right. And then later, uh, when we had another administration, uh, and the more money came in, they decided to give more on each campus and. And so I've never applied, even though I've been nominated many times, uh, uh, a number of times uh, for the next one, you know, distinguished teacher or whatever it is uh, at the university, because uh, I got the one that was only one, and I'm very proud of that, and uh, one's enough. Um, the national awards highly selected because they have national committees evaluating um, your teaching relative to the national goals of geography. So that was very nice, plus it was a very nice place to get the award. It was in Snowbird, Utah. You know, yeah. it's a nice place to be in October. Uh, it was beautiful. But yeah. I remember the story on that, and I can't vouch for the authenticity, but uh, you know, it may be apocryphal, but I think it's correct. That is that when this uh, when this was first awarded, the uh, Great Teacher yeah. Award, we used to call it back right. then. Uh, now it's excellence in teaching. I right, think. But, that's uh, what it is, excellence. But that. Um, uh, was started by, well, I know it was started by uh, uh, President Naylor, Kirk Naylor. Kirk Naylor, who was, yes. Who had the title president, not right. chancellor. Um, but um, he's, the story is that he started it by taking all of the funds that he re received for public speaking engagements and put it into a pot and, um, right. and made a, uh, uh, an right. award of thousand dollars. And he paid taxes on that. That's right. Kirk paid taxes on that because That's something I guess we should have here as part yeah, of the history I, of the and university. I'm glad you too. brought that up. You bet. Uh, it was tax free. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget 1976 we bought our first color TV and we carpeted our house with that money. Because our salaries weren't really the yeah. uh, <laughs> most exemplary ones right. in, the, in the nation at the time. Yeah. So yeah. So this uh, th this 
teaching interest continues, and uh, I'm sure the students uh, the students should really appreciate it. Um, and again, not only students, but because of your uh, being willing to share your knowledge and your research in the you know what good teaching is. Sure. Uh, you've uh, published papers which other people then can read right. and emulate. Um, let's uh, let's see what haven't we talked about yet? We uh, 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 oh, I know what we haven't talked about. What you, the, the many many activities you've had you've had uh, in the area that we sometimes call service, oh, university yeah. service yeah. and yeah. community service. Right. Uh, you were. I, I know you served on the faculty senate. Oh yeah. You really? must have served on more committees than you can uh, even uh, count. Lots well, of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, you, you recall any um, any ones that were particularly yeah. important, maybe? With you and Gordon Hanson, uh, the faculty senate um, became an organization in the early '70s that wielded some notice. Mm -hmm with our administration. And we started doing things for the benefit of not only the faculty, but the staff, and, and especially the students. And the one thing I'm pretty proud of while I was on there, I lost one case because uh, we had so many young faculty mm -hmm. and uh, we couldn't get it through the regions, and that was uh, uh, where uh, the children of faculty could get some tuition remission of some sort. You know, so many of us had sure. kids. I had three of them. I had two finish here after all, one of the masters, but that, that failed because the regents told us that there's no such thing as public institutions that allowed tuition remission for faculty, children, and that was wrong, but it was a dead horse. The thing I do like, though, is we um, uh, organized, uh, and then I began to notice that we had so many final exams sometimes occurring on the same day mm -hmm. that we've, we fiddled around, and Gordon Jensen and I got ourselves on this committee because we really, mm -hmm. Gordon Hanson, not Jensen, Hanson. Gordon Hanson, and uh, said, okay, if kids got three finals in, in the day, one day. The professor must allow that student to delay that final for another time to be organized, the middle one, mm -hmm. all right, if the student wants to. Uh, we also set up an exam schedule that would be consistent from semester to semester, even though you might flip-flop, and uh, things of that nature. Also introducing the idea of dead week because there was too much going on, I felt that, that uh, there were certain professors that I don't remember. In fact, I've even turned a couple of them into you, and you said you'd take care of it, and you did. Um, when you were dean, uh, they, were, they were giving major hour exams as finals during the last week of classes when the kids were supposed to be in our department, at least having lab finals, turning in their research papers, finishing up field projects, and they had all these finals. So then the Senate passed what a dead week percentage should be. And dead week means? There'd be no, nothing other than papers being turned in, laboratory discussion finals, and no exam shall be given that counts more than, what, 20 or 25 percent of their grade. Mm -hmm. I wanted more than that, but the, they weaseled a little bit on it, yeah. so you got to take what you get. Right. So I was pretty proud of that. Uh, and I look down the road to those 70s, those days in the 70s, and I say, some of us worked hard for those students. Once we convinced the administration that this could indeed be done, as the calendar course was changing, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mentioned your um, uh, community activities mm -hmm. as well. I remember that you spent a number of years on the Omaha City City Planning mm -hmm. Board. Mm -hmm. That was how many years? Five years. Um, you can also be renewed, but mm -hmm. I figured that five years was about enough. As an urban geographer with a, one degree in planning, I wanted to see the other side, and that was really not it was as much serving the community, Jack, as it was my learning. We're all learning, <laughs> learning experience all the time. And I learned a lot. And the courses that I now teach, I benefited from that, I think, that planning board experience and the way it was set up at the time. And uh, I didn't ask to be renewed. I figured five years was enough because uh, citizen committees that go, if you're on there longer than that, I've always felt you become more like a club and you're not effective, you start agreeing with the, with, the, with, with the choir, so to speak, and you're not really always representing the needs of the citizens. I imagine you might have even learned something about city politics in that process. Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, I'd known about city <laughs> politics, but that was fun. 
I had garbage spread on my lawn a couple of times for some kind of vote that I'd given, and uh, I didn't turn it into the police because that would just made it worse. Right. Oh, yeah, we have a very active political <laughs> climate in this city, <laughs> at least in the early 80s. What yeah. were some of the things that the city planning board was concerned with back in those days? One thing was getting reasonable growth for infill in the older part of the city, but at the same time not allowing for slip-in apartments without a certain number of parking places and space. Another one was urban growth policy. We had to develop an urban growth policy of some sort that would make the city more convenient for everybody to get here and there, mm -hmm. the concentric you know, growth plan. Uh, I told the mayor and, and the planning board director when I came on that I would, I would accept the position if you would promise to look at the, new, the zoning code. Our zoning code hasn't really been, it was a cumulative zoning or one-way mm -hmm. zoning, and so uh, it wasn't flexible enough. Who was the mayor back then? Uh, Alves uh -huh. was the mayor, and then uh, and then Mike Boyle took on right off mm -hmm. right during that time, and Alden House was planning the director, and when he stepped down after my couple years on the board, Marty Schuchert was, mm -hmm. the, was the planning director. Both all these people were very good, mm -hmm. very good people. And uh, another thing was looking at kinds of planned unit development, uh, looking at mixed land use developments, like as with One Pacific Place, that was our first one and uh, just making this a city that was a city that is in keeping with the future. So that when you come into Omaha, you don't have to hear a pilot say, folks, we'll be landing in Omaha fi in five minutes when we touch down, kindly turn your watches back 30 years. You know, and, and, and that, that old joke, yeah. and, and that's what, what we wanted to do, and the planning board of community people and engineers and businessmen picked up on that. And it was really a good, good experience for me. And it was timely for the university, too, because <laughs> you're building an alumni house. Mm -hmm. I had to step aside, even though it wasn't the university, it was related to the university. That doesn't mean I didn't have the opportunity when asked only, I'm an honest politician, what my feeling was on the alumni house. I said, it's going to be fine. It's about time, and it passed. Mm -hmm. uh, we got into trouble with the KYNE TV tower right here because we didn't tell the city we were going to do it, and it violates the zoning code in this residential zoning category. And the university attorney, whose name I shall not mention in public, <laughs> said, to paraphrase, we are a state organization, university, and we don't have to do what the city says. Well, we went to the... Uh, I was upset, and I had to go to some officials here on campus and said, I think if the university is ever going to be part of this community, I think we have to go down and say, look, I'm really sorry this happened. We got terrible advice from our attorneys in the systems office, and can we work this out? And they let us keep that. Mm -hmm. Well, then when we got the tower, the only gripe that was, you know, uh, Mrs. Durham, right, Marguerite, uh, was that they didn't want the bell to be too loud. <laughs> these, 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 are, these are funny things. The neighborhood asked us to turn down our uh, microphones on our, in our football field. <laughs> because, you know, five times or six times a year, we had announcements out there. And maybe it was loud for some of the high school games. I think Creighton Prep uses it, too. So I had to turn those down. But the only thing was, and I often thought, Jack, got across the street, I'm sorry, St. Margaret Mary's and mm -hmm. Archbishop Reed, they can ring their bell all the time because that's God doing it. Mm -hmm. But the university, <laughs> they didn't want to have too loud a... <laughs> You know, Campanile uh, Carol on this place, or, or Bell Sound. I thought, I thought that was kind of funny. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, some, uh, some people in Omaha, maybe even some of our, some people who may be viewing this on their television sets, will remember you for the um, tours that you've led through uh, ethnic Omaha, where you've... Uh, I know my wife uh, did one of those oh, with you, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and she thought it was absolutely wonderful. Well, do thank you, you still do those? Yes. In fact, T I've could got... Can you tell us a little about them? My urban research interest, once I got through the economic and the planning mm -hmm. part, we're always learning, uh, started gravitating towards who really made this city what it is up to a certain time in space. And it was the immigrant, Jack hard-working people from foreign mm -hmm. lands. Uh, we were half foreign stock in 1920. That was a town of 20, uh, 200,000. Mm -hmm. Whoa! 
And uh, so I started looking into ethnic geography, and I do the ethnic geography tours. Okay, and then I added the symbolism or the iconography of it, so you can see the buildings they built and the names on the buildings. And in fact, I'm giving one for Omaha Curriculum Day on October 2nd, year 2000 here now, mm -hmm. uh, to 160, 175 teachers, and we're taking all of the trolleys out, and we're going around after I talk to them. And I am getting ready to pen an article on immigrants as groups of people and what they leave behind and what they build that reflects, that, that builds, that creates a city. Mm -hmm. Omaha is a microcosm of maybe a Milwaukee or Chicago, but it's nothing like Des Moines that isn't as ethnic. And, and so Omaha is really a great case study. And I still am doing that. I've got, uh, oh golly Jack, one, two, four or five coming up between now mm -hmm. and Thanksgiving. Plus, I'm affiliated, I don't know if you know this, uh, with the Durham Western Heritage Museum. No, I didn't. Where we develop programs that I go in and I give them a slideshow, I answer their questions, and then the museum staff who are, who are made up of educators, public, former public mm -hmm. school teachers, uh, take the kids to the museum and they do exercises. Uh, like a scavenger hunt for, yeah. for kids, yeah. uh, really mainly from about fifth grade through high school age. And so that's a two and a half hour program, and schools can sign up. And I'll come down and do that. It makes it a lot easier for me to go down there and talk rather than running around to all the schools. And it's easier for them to advertise their program that we are an educational museum. And that's my commercial for the Durham Western Heritage Museum. <laughs> they really are, are doing a marvelous job there in that old yeah. Union Pacific Muse Museum, yeah. yeah. Or depot. Yeah. Well, we, um, we've talked about a number of people that you've known over the years here. Mm -hmm. um, talked about Dr. Bale and mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Schills and right. a few others. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure there are many others we haven't talked about. Uh, sure. In the uh, time we have remaining, which isn't too terribly long, but uh, could we uh, want to reminisce a little yeah. bit about uh, other people? If you have any, uh, yeah. you have any good stories about oh, anybody? Oh, boy, I do. Uh, some of you technicians in the studio should close your ears because these people don't mean much to you, but they're very important because these people helped create where we are mm -hmm. right now. Uh, Kirk Naylor at one time, <laughs> I really liked the guy, I always did, mm -hmm. uh, could give a great teacher award and do lots of other things out of his own pocket. You know, that's wonderful. But when he was, was Dean of Administration, was that was it? Okay, Dean of was. Administration under bail. Uh, you remember this. We couldn't have food or coffee pots or anything like that in our office. We had to eat in the student center. We had to take coffee breaks in the student center. And he would come around inspecting. <laughs> on Dr. Bale's orders. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. I'm sure it bothered him a lot. <laughs> but you know, that was pretty good because about 10 o'clock every morning, we trudge over to the student center. There weren't very many buildings on campus, yeah. just a few in, in the 60s. Uh, and, and, and we'd have a couple of tables that nobody seemed to sit at, <laughs> except faculty. It's just kind of, you know, one of these tribal things, I guess. And Jack... We'd have coffee with the football teams, the basketball coaches, the people in places all over campus. We'd meet and just talk about stuff, usually about the university. That was really great. There was a faculty dining room back then. Oh, yeah, too. we had to eat in the faculty dining room. Remember right. that? Uh, I remember my first year here when Dr. <laughs> Bale said, you, uh, uh, we have so many more students now that the uh, student center the cafeteria is getting too crowded and there's not room for faculty in there right. so you eat in your own room right well you know they uh, and then later of course students fussed about having a special room and they <laughs> wanted in and we had uh, the old high school thing of the 1938 building in the administration mm -hmm. building then now arts and sciences hall that had faculty bathrooms and student bathrooms well the students didn't like that mm -hmm. and I thought that was rather strange I thought it was in high school again but but that's the way they built buildings in those days. Sure. And, and yeah, and, and, and uh, we had to eat in that, in that faculty dining room. And uh, golly, on our salaries, Jack, even though it was reasonable, I, I bring my lunch now. I have for the last 30 years anyway. Because <laughs> it's just too far over here to go back and forth a lot uh, with the time we have. But, yeah, some wonderful but that was an opportunity to get to meet other yeah. people, too. Yeah, and I, ha I still have... You know, firm friends that I oh. met because I happened to sit down right. next to them at yeah. a table in that faculty. Right. We get all the skinny and the poop on what was going on on campus and yeah. all these areas, and, and it was really something that I don't have now. And the collegiality, the, the working together, the friendships and the relationships of pulling together to make this a better university, a better teaching, research. 
Yeah, well, we're, you know. We started talking about people. You started talking about, we got into this because you were talking yeah, about Yeah, well, that's what the, the point. It was really an advantage. Right. Another, uh, there are lots of people I remember. Anston Marston, who was, uh, who was, oh, the, who was the, the dean of engineering at the right. time, who served on the planning board in the chair for years, who was an awesome person, Jack. We just had... Yeah, I, st I still think of him as Colonel Marston. Uh, Colonel Marston, right. Uh, you betcha. And he, he was with the Corps of Engineers here. That's in right. The US Army and Corps retired of and then uh, joined our engineering faculty right. and became the first dean of first our dean. College of Engineering, that's which right. we don't have anymore because... Uh, right. But that's another And topic. he liked geography. <laughs> Good. He and Harold Davis, who later became yeah. dean, associate dean, said that the engineers, the civil engineers at this university should either take human geography or economic geography because we want our engineers to know something about the world in which they live. I think it's the only school that's like that. But uh, uh, Anson Marston was a, was a big... Th and, and he let us use his secretary. We didn't have any secretary. We yeah. were in an office area. Back jam. in the municipal university yeah. days, there uh, were no secretaries. No, no. None, we had a pool well, except, of some sort, right, but he had a secretary. Except for the president and the uh, deans. Yeah, he had a secretary, and he let us use her phone if we asked her, mm -hmm. and she would give us messages from home or from students periodically. That's another thing that's yeah. hard for people to yeah. understand, is we didn't have uh, no. that kind of telephones. No. And uh, many and offices didn't have any telephones. We at had all. departments, And you Jack. shared phones. With but we also shared offices, and we shared areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first area I was in, as I was 24 years old, I was a pup. <laughs> and we were in with math, geography, obviously, political science, economics and sociology. Boy, you talk about a mixture. That's talk about cross-fertilization of disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, Dr. Naylor decided that offices should be organized according to people of the same rank, regardless of discipline. At least we were by well, discipline. Well, the professors were together right. and the assistant exactly. professors together. Exactly. So I was in a big kind of a end room. In fact, I watched the KYNE Tower going up. That was an entertainment mm -hmm. in those days. Uh, in a big office area with several desks in it, and I was in with two economists. That was wonderful because uh, my business degree, and I had nearly a minor in economics mm -hmm. in college, uh, you know, we could talk, and, and I'm still friends of mm -hmm. Don Connell mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we had that time together, and both of us, both of us working on our PhDs. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but sometimes those relationships didn't work out, and I've got a lot of funny stories, but I don't think we have time to tell. But we're all together anyway. Well, we have five or six minutes well, more if you've got... Well, oh, yeah, I can. Uh, you talk about presidents I've served with, and all of them had something to do. From Bale was wonderful, even though he interviewed you. Uh, I remember Paul Beck, wonderful Paul Beck in history, a great teacher, so. one of the finest teachers I've ever known, always a tweed jacket of some sort and a bow tie, remember that? Right. <laughs> and one time he, he was telling stories in his class or something, uh, history, and some kid must not have liked it because Bale called he went and complained to Bale. Bale controlled everything, as you've indicated. <laughs> Bale called Paul Beck in. I mean, this is unheard of to me. I come from the University of Arizona. It's a big school, you know. <laughs> and the president is calling one of my colleagues in to ask him what he's doing in his class. He says, Dr. Beck, what are you doing in your classes? Paul looks back and says, I'm teaching history. Bale says, hmm. That's all I wanted to know. You can go now. <laughs> and and that was, to me, that was a funny story. Because to be called by, by the president, and Paul said, I guess I must have given the right answer, or he had no retort for it. Uh, Possibly he just wanted to be yeah. able to say to somebody, yes, I talked with him. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe he did. But you see, we were naive then. I, I, we know about it. As I'm a chair, you're a dean. Sometimes you just have to say something so you can mark it with your superior. I did consult with this faculty. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to mention Connie Clausen here, if I might. Can oh, I yeah, that? she was a, Connie she Clausen was a uh, great person it, in the history. She is one of the best friends of this university. Uh, not to exclude anybody else that I may talk about, because everybody in the olden days uh, and the people that are still here are totally dedicated to what this university is. I want to tell you that. A lot of us were young, and we were from universities that sought athletic activity. So a bunch of us went over to the field house. Remember, it had the, it had the, it had the uh, uh, lust floor, it had dirt floor with a basketball floor on it. <laughs> Stunk. That old right. dirt floor, well, you know what that was. 
And we ask if there's any intramural stuff. Of course, Bert Kurth was there. We wanted to just play. We didn't want to play any intramurals. We just wanted to shoot around and do things in basketball, like one day a week at 3 o'clock. And there was a whole bunch of us, you know, Warren mm -hmm. Frankie, Phil Vogel, uh, Dick Overfield. Uh, uh, I could just go on and on and on with all sorts of people, some people who are still in the community. <laughs> And the, the, we went to the coaches who evidently controlled the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. No, no faculty or anybody else is going to use our gym. Oh, okay. So we were at coffee one day at this big round table that I talked about. Connie was there with Sonia Green, who came mm -hmm. the same year I did in 64. Connie came, I think, in 63. She precedes me by a year. I says, you know, Connie, we need a place to play. The, the men coaches in the men's athletic department just told us to buzz off. Tell you what, Chuck, give me a call Thursday and I'll, I'll give you an answer of some sort. And by golly, that woman who was in that Quonset hut, where the garage is now, called and says, Chuck, I'm going to run the girls out of their locker room at 3.30 on Wednesdays, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And you guys can come in and play all you want to, use the thing. I'll tell the girls there's going to be a bunch of men in there and their faculty and get your cans out of there and uh, stay out until they're, they're gone. And this was a, 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 a tile floor, linoleum tile floor. It was a Quonset hut. God, you couldn't shoot a looper shot, you'd hit the ceiling. That's right. You know? I remember that well. <laughs> and we played and played and played. And I'll tell you right now that in all the years, anytime Connie asked me to do something, whether it be a cheerleader, as you were for the Pepsi Walk, mm -hmm. right? And you still are. Right? I still am, aren't you? I haven't done it for a while. It's fun. Yes, I know. Or, or, or whether, whatever it is. If Connie wants it, I'll do it. She wants to put a political sign out, I will. Uh, because she cared enough to be cooperative and collegial with faculty. Well, um, yeah. give her a little plug. Um, I've done an interview oh, with her, too. very nice. And um, very it's nice. available. You can see okay. it in the library or in the alumni hit center. Yeah. And it has been, uh, it has yeah. been aired on uh, Channel 17. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, one of my daughters. Anybody wants to see that? You know, one of my daughters audience. played ball here and, and uh, played softball here mm -hmm. for four years, Debbie. And my other daughter went to school here, but I'll tell you this. Um, I don't know if I'm stretching it too much or not. Uh, they're telling us we've got to wrap this up right now. Uh, so I, I can't tell her she's, I can't say she's done more for women's sports and title. Oh, than I don't, I think this, everybody who country. knows anything about the university. I, I can't knows say that. that, okay. But I just did. Thank and you, I wanna, Jack. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining us today. This has really been fun. Glad to be here. And to our audience, thank you for joining us today in a visit with Dr. Charles Gildersleeve, Professor of Geography in the UNO Department of Geography and Geology. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.